Hey guys, it's Nick here, and today I just wanted to discuss with you how to get your third-party plugins to be recognized by Ableton Live 10. Um, I'm, I'll try to be as accommodating as possible to PC users as well, since I'm on Mac, but generally the process is the same. Um, there's some exceptions, but overall the it's a pretty straightforward process. Uh, so after you've installed your uh, third-party software, uh, for example, you, you got Serum, or you got Native Instruments Massive, or you got some audio effect bundle from Sound Toys. Um, you're going to want them to be recognized by your DAW to use them in your productions. And the way you do this is you, in Ableton Live, you press Command, Comma, or Control, Comma on PC, and you try to find your, um, your plugin sources. And you find them in the File and Folder tab of your uh, settings. So here, these settings need to be set according to how you installed your, your software, your third-party software. For example, if you're on Mac and you installed audio units, so audio units are simply the Mac native proprietary format for VSTs. That's Mac's version of a VST. That's what Logic uses. Um, if you installed AU versions of your uh, plugins, for example, you got, I don't know, Serum again, and you you got, got the AU version because you're on Mac. Uh, you got to click this button and that instructs Ableton to look for audio unit versions and display them. I'll show you where to find them in a second, but uh, for now, why you would use these things, I would recommend you do use them if you have AU plugins for Mac because it is, after all, I guess a native Mac OS format. And I find that some of the bugs that VST plugins have don't really exist in a audio units. I'm not going to delve too deeply in the, the technical ramifications because A, I'm not particularly well versed in them and B, it'll take up too much time. But generally, I would I would recommend you use audio units if you have access to them since in my, in my experience, they tend to be more stable than the VSTs. Uh, then you need to set where you need to be, where you're going to instruct Ableton to look for these plugins. So if you're just installing your, your plugins, uh, just following the steps of your installer, and you're not specifying where they need to go, uh, then they're probably going to get installed in uh, your system folder for VST plugins. That uh, Your MacBook or your, your Apple computer or whatever has a certain folder that it understands plugins need to go into, and all of your kind of plugin manufacturers that you're, that you're uh, purchasing your stuff from, they're going to instruct their installers to throw their plugins into that folder. So, for all intents and purposes, if you're not using external hard drives for your plugins, or if you're not putting your plugins on a specific folder that's not that's just designated by you, then you can just click this and not worry about it, and you're gonna be just fine. However, if you are using a, a custom folder, if you I don't know want to put your plugins on an external hard drive, for example, then you need to click use use VST plugin custom folder, turn that on. Now, what this opens on Mac, at least, well, it, well it, on both Mac and PC, it would open the uh, a, a, basically a browser field, and you can find the folder that you want, and then open it, and then that's where your um, plugins will be scanned. But what's shown by default is this is the plugins folder for Mac, and uh, the native uh, default system folder. The way you get to it is by Macintosh.hd, then the library, audio, and then the plugins, and then here you can see all of the formats. Components, uh, these are just the AUs. It's a different word for AU. And these are all your VSTs. Um, I tend to have both component and VST versions of my plugins because some software like OBS actually uses VSTs. You could use VSTs to modify your voice and stuff. Uh, but other software will enable to use components and also things like ScreenFlow, like Apple specific stuff, uh, that uses AUs only. So you should. Uh, it might be prudent to have both versions. But this is your default system folder. Um, anyway, yeah, but we're not going to be using uh, custom folders for this particular tutorial. And then once you're done and you've set everything up, uh, you just click rescan. And then you're going to, Ableton is going to scan the folder that you provided it. And then it's going to show your plugins. And you find them over here in this particular button, uh, plugins button. And this panel just shows you both your VSTs and your audio units. 
So, uh, what do you do from here? Well, uh, these are just your folders that you have. And say you want to open up your serum, you can just double click it. And Ableton understands whether this is a software, uh, whether this is a, an instrument plugin or an audio effect plugin. Uh, it understood that this is in fact an audio or a, a MIDI instrument, and so it made an instrument, uh, it dropped it into a MIDI track and placed it as an instrument. For example, if I was to use an audio effect, I'm going to delete this. If I was to use and just double click an audio effect from, for example, Sound Toys, I'm going to double click my decapitator. Uh, it's going to leave a space here because it understands that this is an effect and not a instrument. Um, so really, uh, I'm just I can just do a quick comparison uh, between two I guess the two candidates for comparison between stock and uh, third party plugins in this context would probably be Serum by Transfer or Exfer, uh, whichever way is the correct way to pronounce it. I like to just say transfer and uh, Ableton's uh, wavetable synth, which is available in Ableton Live 10. Um, by the way, to keep these two open and to switch tracks and not have Serum disappear on you, what you need to do is press Command or Control C and find your uh, go into your look and feel and click multiple plugin windows and uh, disable auto high plugin windows so that you can compare these two. Um, so I mean just a cursory evaluation would show you that the GUI is way more detailed, right? Both of these synths have two oscillators and both are wavetable synths, but I mean there's a world of difference, for example, in the waveform selection you have 30, 30 waveforms here and here you have an absolute plethora of wave, waveforms and not only that, you can create your own waveforms by clicking this little pencil button. And there's an incredibly detailed and frankly revolutionary um, uh, waveform wizard here. And you can make them and to whatever taste you want. And then if you're not satisfied with that, well, you can actually import your audio files. So say you want to re you recorded your violin, you can throw that into here as a waveform that you can save and use uh, in your other patches and stuff. So it's hugely versatile. All of these envelopes, um, you know, multiple envelopes, multiple LFOs, which are incredibly detailed. They can resemble like a massive Native Instruments massive performer. Um, you can loop them and you can have step sequencing and you have FM modulation and you have noise oscillator and you have effect modules, which are incredible. Um, just a few uh, very detailed uh, mod matrix as opposed to a very kind of simple one here. This is the extent of what's what's possible. And that's not to say that the wavetable synth in Ableton is bad. It's a fantastic synth. It's just that um, it's really designed for a different purpose. Ableton Live, uh, it's a comp Ableton's not a company that they're not plugin developers. They're primarily DAW developers. They want to make a good DAW. So um, I guess they encourage or they expect people to look to third-party solutions for more technical uh, technical requirements like uh, for example requiring FM synthesis uh, in a wavetable synth um, that's just something that you need to uh, spend some money on to, uh, to invest in this feature and I think it's completely worth it but again it's not to say that you need these third-party plugins to be a good musician or make good music uh, it just might take a, a bit longer not using them but ultimately you can still achieve fantastic results with these synths because these um, these effects and these these instruments are of a very high quality and they're designed for very quick and creative work which is kind of what the ethos of Ableton Live really is it's kind of uh, practical devices practical synths with easy GUIs um, to create a simple sound uh, or to create uh, a nice, usable, serviceable sound quickly. Anything that requires more detail, you know, you need to uh, look to third-party solutions. Uh, for example, I mean, let's say I want to use a EQ, right, to apply to my sound. Um, 
these EQs are quite good actually. In fact, I prefer them most of the time. I just use this one, especially Ableton Live 10, has a quite a nice uh, range. It goes down to 10 kil t to 10 hertz, so it's quite a quite a, a powerful EQ uh, for just being a default kind of stock equalizer. But if you do want something like more detail, then you would look to some a classic one is uh, FabFilter Pro Q by FabFilter. This is Pro Q2, and what this has this has a lot of interesting things. Uh, again, it's all about detail. What you're what you're paying for when you buy these plugins is detail. You have different mechanisms by which you can, for example, set up your your phase of your EQ. A zero latency EQ might well it, it'll have zero latency but it might switch your phase of your of your sound too much and for example if you're eqing a snare drum with a zero latency format and i think the eq that's the default eq8 um, mechanism zero latency will uh, destroy the phasing of your snare it'll change it and then if you're layering that snare with other snares just simply EQing one of the snares will completely screw up the entire layer. Like, uh, altogether, you're going to just create huge phasing problems. So, to remediate this problem, you have this linear phase option, which all it does, you have different degrees, all it does is it introduces a huge latency to your sound. You're going to have to wait like a second for your, for your song to even start playing if you're using maximum. But what this does is it prevents any phase distortion. And, you know, that's an option that you might want to have if you're, you know, an audio engineer or something. Um, so, yeah, another thing this, this um, particular equalizer has that, that the uh, EQ8 doesn't is you have a lot of these interesting um, uh, EQ shapes. You have, bell no you have all of these cool notches. You know, you obviously gonna, you're going to have these exact ones in uh, in the uh, EQ8, but you have slight differences like the notch and the tilt shelf and stuff like that. These are quite good. Um, let me see here. Let's say I want to have a low cut, and you have huge values. That's also a really important point about this equalizer is that you have very extreme. Like say I want to have a brick wall uh, low pass filter. To cut out maybe some sub in my mastering process and cut out you know everything up to 20 hertz i don't want to be too soft on those frequencies for example um, i'm not saying that you know you should actually be doing this but you would select the highest possible um the highest po possible uh, decibel value here for 96 decibels per octave of, of uh, filtering so this basically gives you a very sharp cutoff um, this kind of a detail, you can't really get this kind of thing in, in EQ8. So that's really what, what you would purchase these plugins for. It's for greater control over detail. Um, and ultimately, I hope that you come away from this tutorial with some understanding of what you're paying for when you buy these things. For example, even with a DAWs like FL, which have a huge library of, of instruments and effects, and they're really great. Some of them are so great that people justify just buying FL Studio altogether by virtue of how great some of their synths are. Stock synths like Harmer. In the case of FL, for example, I, would, I wouldn't even make a really strong case for uh, buying third-party plugins, especially if you're just starting out. I mean, there's absolutely no use for them because you have a, such a huge, rich library of, so of sounds and of instruments and effects. In Ableton, it's a bit less, you, you don't really have as wide of a palette, but the, the, the synths, nevertheless, are incredibly powerful, especially synths like Operator, uh, very strong um, and simple to use. FM synth, it makes FM quite easy to understand, actually. You know, you don't have as many synths, but you have the synths that you do have, it's, it's just quality over quantity, right? You have very high quality uh, synths, and you can still make very competitive, interesting, modern music that competes easily with anything at the top level. So I hope you guys can uh, come away from this with, with some appreciation for what these things can do, but also an understanding of the fact that this is, um, this is all relative. 
uh, and really it's the tools at your disposal they're just tools at your disposal and it's really the artists that can actually make something make something of them so i hope you guys can uh employ both third-party plugins and stock plugins together for your next productions to uh i guess get the best of both worlds so all right thank you very much and have a great day Thank you.